I'm back. Oh, hey, no communicating Hola. with each other. <laughs> you can't tell me what to do. Wait. <laughs> no communicating <laughs> with oh, one yeah. another. All right. So. For that. <laughs> so this is what I would do if I was doing some colors. So check it out. So it's just, it's really just optical illusions, right? Like all of our vision is just a lie, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I forget what it was exactly, but I found this out some time not too long ago. But like, even like the time that we see stuff is is a lie. Um, what does this mean? Like, so, you know, like being able to like look across the room and then thinking that you looked at it in real time when in reality it was slowed down so you could register what you were looking at. If that makes sense. Like if you rotate your head pretty rapidly or if you look around, it's actually slowed down. Like literally in your brain, it slows it down until it catches up. Um, I think that's something along those lines. I could be wrong about the specifics. So that's all color is to me is just an illusion. Okay. Uh, values is the truth. Getting your values right. That's, that's what reveals the truth. And so to do that, what you got to do is you just got to like begin, you know, designing in a way where if you want something to feel a little bit more vibrant, right? You don't have to just increase the saturation of everything, right? So like, for instance, obviously if I increase the saturation here, it's gonna feel pretty cool. But on the counter, you can add desaturated colors and values, right? So actually let's try to, Stay within the same value range. Yeah, but can I ask you something? Like, would you go uh, with like the complementary color into the shadows to get like those, like the vibrancy in the neutrals? You don't have to. It could just all be just desaturated version because it's all a lie, right? Like you look at this color here, right? The one that's like yeah. mixed in with the saturated color, right? It looks pinkish. Yeah. Like it has a bit of like a tint of red in there. At least it feels that way, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when we actually eye drop it, you probably can guess what's going to happen next. Oops. I didn't eye drop it. And we go in this closed experiment. So that's the same value. Yeah. Right? Because even in that, even if you're like, well, it looks just a little bit gray. Like here, it doesn't look gray at all. Right? Yeah. But it's, I assure you, it's the same value here. Or same color. You see what happened there? In fact, it's kind of... It can be dangerous to kind of think of it always in complementary. Like if you go here and think, okay, you know, I want to get a desaturated pink, it actually may have the opposite effect where it may look a little too warm, you know? Yeah. And which, which is interesting because when I look at this color here, You know, it's still blue, you know, or like that purple, right? Yeah. Because if you were to just generally do it, unless you're trying to make a statement, which is totally fine, right? Like in, when you're painting, you know, like just saying, like, bam, you know? Like Frazetta did this a lot, oh, his yeah. paintings. He would just straight up do it, and it's great. Uh, but he his values were top-notch so it didn't really matter 
you know um ruin jaya is another good example of this he yeah. also just nails yeah his colors uh, are really cool. no he nails the values and so then he can just put whatever yeah, well, color he wants yeah. <laughs> well not also that's what makes his paintings look so visceral is the fact that his values are mostly in the midtones and he just pull pushes and pulls from there you could take most if not all of his paintings and change the color and it'll still work that's what i'm saying like people get caught up in color but it's actually just get your values straight you know yeah uh, i got you on that one yeah it's it's just uh it's just people get impressed when they see cool colors you know they say oh man look at those colors because whenever they try to attempt it themselves it doesn't come off the same way so they feel like there's something that they don't understand about colors uh you mentioned nathan faux he also is a master of values oh yeah, yeah for sure. uh most traditional if not all traditional artists will tell you that it's all about the values knowing those values is what's key um yeah but like don't get me wrong you could totally jump into a painting with all sorts of colors too and then just fix it later so here let's try to do one right now where i will use a brush like this yeah But anyway, yeah, as I'm doing this, any other questions? Oh, you know, I actually have a question. Um, Go for last, it. Last session, you had said that um, you had gotten advice from all these different, like, art people like you mentioned like scott robertson and other people like that like i was wondering like how did you mm -hmm. how did you like approach and how did you get involved with those people i just ran up to them and screamed ah. <laughs> that's okay. it that's all you gotta do good luck i'll keep that uh, in mind <laughs> no i just uh approached them just talked to them uh if you go to events that's obviously a great way to do that uh, if you can't go to events for obvious reasons recently, um, another way is to just talk to them online. You know, just actually talk to people. Like yeah, I would message, sense. yeah, I would message people often, especially when I first started out. I still do here from time to time. Um, but the reason behind, you know, just talking to people is that, you know, most artists, are totally cool they're not as you know they're not as uh weird or arrogant or unapproachable as you might think most of them are some of them are very few and if you do run into an artist like this uh yeah fuck them <laughs> you know? they might still have a good critique though maybe right <laughs> yeah sure um, what but I'm getting at is, yeah. no, what I'm getting at is that, is that like, you know, most artists are friendly and mm -hmm. you'll see that. You'll just see that. Now, if they don't respond to you, that's, you shouldn't be offended by that either. Um, especially those who are really popular and have huge followings. They're obviously going to be probably harder to get a hold of. You know, I'm starting to get to the point where it's really hard to, for me to like respond to my Instagrams. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. um, but my point is, is that it's just not as hard as you think to talk to individuals. And one of the things that I think helps me is that I'm just a, you know, friendly individual. I like talking to people. I like making friends. Uh, when my yeah, kids started going with... to, 
Yeah, when our kids started going to school and they were, you know, looking to make friends, you know, they weren't really approaching my, many of the kids. Uh, so I did for them. You know, I went up to them and talked to these kids' parents for them, literally made friends with these parents. Yeah, like I collect parents like Pokemon. <laughs> because, uh, why not? You know? And and even then, most people were just like, yeah, okay, cool, what's up? Mm-hmm. You know, like, people are just afraid of uh, rejection or social isolation or anything of that nature. So they tend to not interact or want to interact with individuals because of that. But it's kind of silly because the worst case scenario is that someone treats you like a dick and it just shows you that they're a dick. Like if you go up to somebody and just say, hey, how you doing? Like, what's your name? Like, I'd like to, you know, hang out, whatever. You know, especially if the context makes sense, like you're at an event, you know, hey, you know, I just want you to take a look at my portfolio if you get a chance or hey, you know, I'm a big fan of yours. That's all I wanted to say. Like that kind of stuff goes a long way, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, you should be all right. I think that when people get caught up with uh, focusing on what could go wrong, they don't realize what can go right. And for me, I, I don't have this problem. A very, very friendly individual. And I try to uh, lead with that in most, if not all, situations. You know? Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, and so how do I approach these people that are giants? That's how I do it. I go out of my way, man. Uh, Yeah, I wasn't sure if you had any, like, special, uh, like, you know, you went to some special meeting or or something like that. or or (laughs) Oh, yeah, there's a loop. There's Illuminati meetings in our industry. Yeah, actually. Yeah. I forgot to t- tell you guys about this. So what you have to do is you have to eat the yeah, what's their goat. Number? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. There's no number. You just got to eat a goat. Goat's okay. heart. Okay. Um, and then people will call you. They'll know. And no, there's you know there's nothing new. It's just like events and stuff. Like my, one of my close friends, Dan uh, Levisi, I made friends with him. I made friends with him by messaging him on Facebook. He wrote back, we started hanging out, and the rest is history. Nice. You know? But it was really just that. And I was also approached by other people to do events, same thing. They just messaged me and I said, yeah, sure. Well, cool. I will keep all this in mind. And then yeah. you guys forward to your art book. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, to me, it's really, it's really not crazy, you know? Um, it's just, like I said, most people just don't want to be rejected or be embarrassed. Mm-hmm. The worst that can happen is that you're embarrassed. The best thing that can happen is that you've now got some life-changing advice or made a friend for life. Yeah. I don't think I've ever been like embarrassed. Uh, I've definitely been in situations where someone's just like, I can't talk. And it just like rolled out. Uh, Mike Mignola, the guy who created Hellboy, that's what happened. I saw him oh. at a party. I was like, dude, you're Mike Mignola. <laughs> and he was like, I am, and I'm leaving. I'm old. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, man. Well, just wanted to say I'm a big fan and have a good day, you old man. And then he just laughed and then he just left. And, um, that was it. But then uh, he messaged me later and he said, hey, I realized it was you. I didn't realize it was, you know, that I was talking to you. Uh, but I thought about it later and I was like, wait, was that Anthony Jones? And I was like, oh yeah, no big deal, dude. Because, you know, at that time I am more notable artist, you know? And I have messaged him and talked to him online quite often, like on Facebook posts and stuff. But uh, it was cool. cool. 
It was cool yeah. that he responded back after the fact. But if he never did, then I wouldn't have, you know, been upset. Mm -hmm. He told me why he was leaving, and I believe him. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, and even if I didn't believe him, like, it's none of my business why he's leaving. You know? Yeah. I'm not entitled to his attention. And I think that's the way to go about it. Like, whenever I talk to people about this type of stuff, I say, you know, try to make friends, don't network. You know? So if you go into conversations trying to network, you know, sometimes I think people could feel that. People will know. Yeah, they can sense that you're just trying to squeeze out some advice and squeeze out some something. Like, they, they are going to give you something, you know? Or they mm -hmm. owe you something. They, they can sense that. But if you're going into conversations like, you know, I just want to hang out. I'm just ha even just happy to be here. That's just, that goes way differently. You know? Yeah. But, uh, but that's it. That's all I got to say about that. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, it will pass. We'll we'll go back to normal life, probably mid next year. Eventually. Yeah, uh, because I think what's going to happen. Actually, hold on. Give me a second. I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'll tell you the future. One second. Back. So what I think is going to happen in the in the future is uh, we're all just going to get super sick, and it's going to get real bad. That's and then uh, we would, yeah, and then we're going to have herd, herd immunity. Right. It's, it's inevitable. You think it'll, it'll go that route? Oh, I, I'm almost certain it will, yeah. I just watched a video during the break of some lady running like full speed into a restaurant window. Uh, not shattering it, but she did it because, because of she the went, virus. Uh, no, because she wanted to go into the restaurant to eat, uh, but mm. she didn't have a mask, so they didn't let her in. Okay. And then that was her reaction. Very reasonable. And uh, she started licking the glass of the window. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> this is America. Yeah. Some people think we should have, um, we should have just, you know, Taken the herd immunity approach immediately and not even went into lockdown, just you know, get yeah, it over. Sure. Yeah, and I, I understand that. You know, we want to like get back to just you know, getting our Starbucks and going into restaurants. Uh, we, we're definitely spoiled, <laughs> you know. Totally. Um, it's really not that much to ask, you know, to be a little bit more um, distant. Uh, wear a mask, wash your hands, good hygiene, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we should already should have been doing this. Like the common cold kills tons of people. And it's it's from the same family of diseases, of viruses. <laughs> but we don't care. Nobody does, takes the flu shot. And so... Um, so yeah, I, I think what might have happened is that we would have done that. It would have been really bad and our economy would have been devastated. Not because people are unemployed because of a lockdown, but because lots of people are sick and dying. And um, uh, it's not young people, right? It's, it's usually older generations, but those older generations will be you know, clogging the health system because they're all sick and dying. Oh, hold on just a second. You guys turn that on, please. Um, but also because uh, America, we are not a, we're not a very healthy nation. Wait, hold on just a second. Delilah, Delilah, you're talking so loud. Um, she has her headphones on, so she's like talking super loud. So we're not like we're we're morbidly obese nation, 
and we have a lot of unhealthy individuals, mostly because most people can't afford to go to a hospital. So there's not a lot of prescriptive measures that people take to try to have better health. You know what I mean? Uh, Are you in the States? Am I in the States? Yeah. Yeah. When's the last time you've seen a doctor? Um, I think uh, it wasn't too long. I think it was just a general checkup. But um, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I got lucky. Um, They they allowed like in-person meetings and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I, I usually time? make sure to, to you know go get checked out. That's actually really good. Yeah. If I was to ask that of the other students, maybe they would not give the same answer. Uh, I would be <laughs> Okay, that's the answer I was hoping for. <laughs> you know, some people say like never, right? Um, if we go, yeah, into I dentist, know a few people who just have n- just like don't. never yeah. ever, yeah. All right, what's a doctor? Um, <laughs> Yeah, if I say the same thing about dentistry, like that's definitely a thing that people don't go through a dentist. I actually just went, speaking of which. See, you're really good. So you're amongst the minority. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have not. I guess Uh, really almost a decade, I think, since I've seen a dentist. Wow. Yeah, because it costs a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, not totally. Yeah, so I just just brush my teeth violently. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good approach. Yeah. But it's one of those things, you know, it's one of those things. And we have a lot of that in our nation. So this is what I'm saying. So next year, um, mid next year, I think we'll start, we'll be seeing some positive changes. Um, but it's going to be good, bad first. But in the meantime, in terms of like trying to get the jobs, my advice is to absolutely post online a lot, engage on online communities a lot, so forth and so on. Yeah, those are good tips. Any other questions? Rendo? I don't got anything else. Dumb question. Wait, what? I feel like it's like a general kind of dumb question. I think it's a dumb question. Uh, It was more of like, if we have like a question that kind of comes up like over the course of you know like not class, can we use like messy humor questions? Like it's like hey, I don't understand this, and just like ask you something. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's not a dumb question. Why would you think it's a dumb question? Because I'm just that person who doesn't want to bother anyone, so I just keep everything inside. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I um, I think that is fine. So think about the way that that was handled. You asked. That's exactly the way you should do it. You shouldn't just assume. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I try. Uh, I try. It's, it's a bad habit. Yeah, I think um, the way I like to see my students is that you guys, you know, support me, so I support you. It's in my best interests too. To make sure you guys turn out great. Hey, are you using like a color dodge or? Yes, I am. Color dodge, color doji. Well then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm switching between color dodge and just regular painting. I did have a question about uh, as far as like freelancing goes. Uh huh. As far as like trying to get all like, your paperwork in order and I like, guess handling things, because that's just something I personally struggle with. Like, how do you go about? Like, what's your system? I like, guess um, how you handle stuff. Like when you do like do things like that. Sorry, say that again. It's more like what's your like? Okay, like I guess how you balance between like it's like if you're freelancing, how you're balancing your what your workload, and then you know your actual life. Like, how does that go for you? Oh, I see. Um, When I'm doing it the best, which I haven't been lately because like this new job has thrown me off. off. Um, But hopefully, in the coming week, I'll be able to fix that finally. Um, uh, 
timers and calendars. There's tons of timers and calendars. Right? Like if you have a calendar that's telling you to eat, like a calendar reminder, mm-hmm. that's part of the deal. Huh. Like if you think about like when you go to school, like a lot of that stuff is, you know, scheduled. Yeah. Like even when you eat, right? Lunch. Mm-hmm. Um, when you work, same thing. So when you're productive at work, that's usually why, because you are accountable to a certain schedule. You know? Okay. And so when you are on your own and there is no schedule, time just (laughs) slips by. And it just feels chaotic. But if you give yourself kind of like a nine to five, you'll you'll do better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but you gotta stick to it. You know, you gotta say, okay, at this time I'm gonna do these things at this, you know, instant etc cetera, etc cetera. make sense mm-hmm. and so so for instance i would have a timer to wake me up i have a timer to tell me to eat lunch dinner i have a timer to tell me to um you know um, do certain work check certain emails i would have a timer to remind me to you know sleep you know yeah. it's all sorts of stuff and i'll anything that happens like like life stuff like if i have like life events i will put them on a calendar like right away like someone would be like hey you know you have a doctor's appointment at this time or you have a meeting at this time put on the calendar otherwise i'll forget which reminds me i have a couple of things that i've already forgotten because i haven't put them on the calendar case and point you know yeah So that's <clears throat> that is my advice, generally speaking. Um, and one thing that I will say to that effect, the reason why people fall into this trap of like, you know, not using a, or like falling out of schedule, the reason why this even happens is just because people have a sense of time. You know, they just don't. Most people don't. And they have to train for it. And what this means is that, have you ever been in those situations where you would wait, like for, I don't know, like you're at the DMV and you're waiting to get called and it just feels forever. Like Mm -hmm. it feels like three hours have gone by, but honestly, it's just been like 20 minutes. Yeah. And then have you ever been in a situation where you've played a video game that you really like with your (laughs) friends and you feel like it's only been 20 minutes? but actually three hours have gone by Yep. the opposite. Yeah. So that's evidence that you have no idea how time works. Like actually like the way it works physically, like you can't feel it. Like you can't feel 20 minutes, you know, it depends on your perception of the time. So using a timer teaches you how to feel 20 minutes, like what 20 minutes feels like. Does it make sense? Yes. <clears throat> so yeah, I use timers a lot too when I'm trying to be really poignant. Okay. Yeah. If you don't use timers, you don't schedule your, your day to day, you don't create like a list. Yeah, it's gonna be hard to manage and you're just going to see that you don't manage your time. Now, yeah. when you do, when you start to manage your time, guess what ends up happening? Things get better. Well, it's like when you're keeping track of things better. Things you done. you start to have more time than you realize you have. Oh. Because you start to see where you're wasting time. And that's really the value of it. You know what I mean? You'll start to see like, hey, you know, I was on my phone like for a good five hours today. Like why? You know? Yeah. Like some people don't re- recognize it, but like, you know, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes before lunch, 30 minutes after lunch, 30 minutes before dinner, 30 minutes after dinner. You see how that can like just add up, just adds up, adds up. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, five hours. And you're just like, whoa. Yeah, there was a, um, you probably heard of Alex Beto's because I was watching one of his uh, videos on like the earth station learning thing. And oh, he cool. said like one of the things that he did was, uh, I guess, uh, when he was first doing this, but he would every 30 minutes to an hour, he would write down what he was doing. 
and he's kind of kept a time journal. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I did that for like a, I did that for a couple of days. I was like, "Holy crap! Look at the time I'm wasting." Yeah, that's exactly right. That's I've started to do making. lists, but it's like my issue was like I I personally will like I'll ignore a timer sometimes, and then I'm like, "Oh, it's not a big deal." We'll hit the snooze button, and I won't get up, and then lo and behold, it's an hour later. Yeah. So so just like it takes time to get good at like art, it takes time to get good at time management. So the next time you hit the snooze button, know that when you're doing that, you are actively training against what you're training for, right? Like imagine if you're, you're drawing and every time you started to encounter a little bit of a bad habit, mm -hmm. you just went pencils down and stopped drawing, right? It's counterproductive. But instead what you do is you probably fight through it, right? You try to get better you try to learn try to study that's what you should be doing with time management you shouldn't so if if, a, if you cannot wake up then anything else you do might not be worth like worrying about yet in terms of time management like do that first can you stop hitting the snooze button and do that for like a week you know and mm -hmm. make that your only most important goal stop hitting snooze wake up when I want to wake up when I told myself I was going to wake up, you know, mm -hmm. that's it. Just do that. Do that for like a week. And then after you do that, like, okay, spend one hour doing anatomy studies or whatever you think is going to be valuable for you to study at the time. Right. Yeah. One hour. Doesn't matter if it sucks. Doesn't matter if I hate it. I have to fill up time. That is the quest. It is not a matter of quality. It is a matter of consistency that I'm trying to hit here. Right. When I learned programming, that's exactly what happened. I learned programming in two years, specifically doing the thing I just said. You know? Yeah. I actually did, I didn't think of it that time management was like, you know, a practice skill that you just teach yourself. I didn't really realize it like that. Yeah. Uh, most things, if not all things, are this way. Do you know? Mm -hmm. Most things that are reasonable. Like um, getting good at creativity, that's a thing you can get good at. Getting good at patience, you can get good at patience. You can get good at better temperament. All these things you can train. If you have really large personality flaws, you can train yourself to get better at them. Maybe not over overcome them. Some things are just impossible to overcome, but you can manage them. Like if I know I have students who had some real severe anxiety and depression and so that's just one of those things that I'm not qualified to help people with. Yeah. But what I am good at is understanding how to get good at stuff. Right. Yeah. And so I, I taught them how to like what I would do. Like if I had this situation, if I had this problem, what I would do to try to get better at it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, if I, if you're telling me, this is me speaking to the student, that you have this anxiety issue where you're always feeling anxious after drawing or painting for about an hour, then don't draw for an hour. Draw for 30 minutes and then stop. Then take a 30 minute break. Just take a break. And then get back to it for another 30 minutes. Do that for like a whole day, off and on. The next day, try to add 10 more minutes, do 40 minutes. And the next day, try to add 10 more minutes until you get all the way to an hour and then try to see if you can go beyond that. You know? Mm -hmm. And I say match the time too. Like if you spend an hour, take an hour break, you know? Yeah. And uh, the student did that and they did great. And they felt a lot better. And I told them the same thing I told you. You know, like um, think of it as a skill to get good at, you know? No matter how much I train, maybe I'll never be as fast as you see in Bolt, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'll get real fast, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I'll get super fast. I just won't be as fast as him because maybe there's, it's just not in the cards for me. There's just too many things going against me and going for him, you know? Yeah. But that's not the focus, right? The focus is to just get good to overcome certain problems that you may have. Yeah. I did have one other thing I guess somewhat related to that 
Yeah, sure. Um, what about like how, like, as far as like hand stretches, is like keeping your hands, you know, from like knocking carpal tunnel. Like, what do you do for that? Yeah. So one thing I I do is I don't push down very very hard on any and all things that I use. So I don't have a posture that's detrimental to my ability to draw well. Meaning that um, a lot of people that I know, they push down really hard on their tablet. Mm -hmm. And so then they get like a lot of wrist pains and, and all that stuff. And then another thing is that like my posture is just built to not do this. Like I, I have a standing desk and I use a wake up tablet. I don't use a wake up Cintiq. So I'm not hunched over. My arms are equally extended and I'm about two to three feet away from my um, monitor. So I'm in a good posture most of the time. <clears throat> uh, and another thing is I just eat really well. Eat lots of vegetables. And because of this, I have less cloggage in my arteries. And this low cloggage in my arteries uh, is distributed throughout my entire body, including my wrists. You know, like, yeah. I was talking to my friend who, uh, carpal tunnel, let's look into it. Uh, I was talking to my friend about this and he never thought about it in this way where it's like, you know, your body in health has contributed to your brain. Like your brain is also part of your body. And I think you know this. It's pretty obvious when you say it, but, but nobody thinks about it the way that I think about it, or not too many people. Well, when I say that, I mean like your brain is just another physical thing. Your thoughts are all physical. They're not, we, we defined mental mentality and physicality as being separate, but the reality is they're the same. They're all physical. If I take a hammer to your arm, I'll break your arm. If I take a hammer to your brain, I'll break your brain. Yep. If I don't kill you from breaking your arm, which is very unlikely to kill somebody from breaking someone's arm, right? Where killing someone's brain is more likely. But let's say I don't kill you, but I hit the part of your brain that controls language. You'll stop speaking in proper language. Yeah. Just like you can't use your arm anymore if you, your arm's broken, right? Mm -hmm. It's a physical manifestation. Your memories are proteins and uh, connections. Right? Yeah. Everything is just an illusion, man. It's, it's like, <laughs> it's just, it's just how we perceive like this idea. Like, this is also why I don't, uh, I, I'm vegan, right? So I don't eat animals. And one of the reasons is because I, I recognize that most animals are incredibly sentient and they're conscious, clearly conscious. Uh, I remember I was talking to my friend about this. He's like, you know, well, I see like papa bears murdering like they're young, right? So they're clearly different from us. I'm like, what are you talking about? We have humans that do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, and I said, and the mama bears always defend the baby bears if that happens, right? Mm -hmm. And then he was just like, well, that's instinct. I was like, what? What do you think that we have? You think that we do it out of some sort of weird moral code? It's instinct too. You instantly love your child. At least most normal humans do, right? Yeah. Because we have been ev evolved in this way, you know? Mm -hmm. Like why we think, are think, think things are cute is because they look like babies. Big eyes, big heads, disproportionate to proportions, you know? Mm -hmm. that's, all, that's not a coincidence, you know? That's clearly an evolutionary trait of us being human animals. And the brain is no different. When we look at mice brains and gorilla brains and we think, whoa, look at this thingy. And we think of them differently, that's arrogance. The only, yeah. thing, the only thing that makes us different is that we're really good at copying and we're very creative. Copying means like when you grow up, someone told you that that's a cat and that's what we call it. And you said, okay. You didn't question it. 
You didn't look into the philosophy and the hierarchy of why we call things cat. You didn't look into history. We're actually gorillas and, and other apes. Uh, they think this way. They're like, why? Why am I doing this thing? They don't do things. They're actually very intelligent in this. They actually question. They're very skeptical. They're very creative too. But that skepticism is actually what prevents them from being evolved. Where our lack of skepticism from some of the greatest minds is because of like that trust of like the previous generations of knowledge, like religion, cultures, that's all we're good at copying that. Right. Yeah. And that piggybacking with no question really allows us to kind of grow exponentially our technologies and our cultures. I never thought uh, of it like that. Yeah. And so like when you get in an airplane, you don't question who, who made it. You don't question the people next to you. You don't question who's flying it. You know nothing about this airplane. And yet you trust that it's going to take you to where you're going. I've never been on the airplane. <laughs> oh, okay. But you got to say, like, uh, if you've been yeah, in a no, car, if you've taken an Uber, Uber is one of those, uh, like, it's a great example of this, actually, right? Uber, Lyft. Like, it's one thing, like, if it's a taxi driver, it's like an organization. Like, Uber and Lyft, like, a lot of people are like, oh, people are going to just be raping and murdering. <laughs> But no, there's this 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 system in place that everyone just listens and just understands, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so um, so the symptoms are key symptoms of pain in the arm, uh, usually with numbness or tingling, uh, in the hands, wrist, or forearms. Also, calls as hand numbness, pins and needles, hand clumsiness, uh, uh, weakness, swelling of the tendons. That's usually what it is. And when you have swelling, it's either from overuse or cloggage. When you have clogged arteries, you have swelling of your your tissues. You know? Mm -hmm. If you remove that, there'll be less swelling. When you eat foods that prevent less swelling, yeah. less inflammatory, you're just not going to have it. I used to have carpal tunnel. And it went away. Uh... It wasn't because of my bad posture. It wasn't because of this. It's because I used to eat like tons and tons of like inflammatory types of foods. I used to have such bad like numbness in my hand that I would have to lift my arm above my head for like five oh, seconds. Wow. Every like five to ten minutes. Okay. It was like a routine. Yeah. Yeah, but you can see how like thinking in this way is as unpoetic as it feels to be like not think of it this way but again that's again a human invention poetry and like this sort of weird kind of prestigious persona you know just stop thinking this way you'll actually live a better life um, because you'll stop being so like mystical you'll stop questioning things everything will just be so much more obvious you know, like I have a friend who was telling me, like, well, what about, like, then why don't you just, if you don't think that there's any value there, right, mm -hmm. um, then why, why, did, why live at all? And I was like, well, that's because you're making it seem like the only thing worth living for is for some greater good. When in reality, it could just be really selfish. You just did an animal and you want to survive, yeah. right? <laughs> And so if you think of it practically in that way, it's like obviously murdering and killing is not a good survival tactic because you'll go to jail and you'll be put to jail uh, yeah. uh, to death. Uh, stealing and murdering is also short term because others will look at you as a criminal, right? Yeah. Also, it's just in my biology not to do that. I just don't like to do it. You know, I just don't feel good for no other reason that it's just in my bones which I'm thankful for, you know? Cause yeah. I could see if I didn't, I would be a sociopathic um, opportunist, you know? Yeah. And so uh, I would be like a politician probably or a, or a lawyer. <laughs> but my point is, is that there's plenty of practical reasons. Um, my children, I love my children. I want them to have a better life. So this is why I try to be lead by example. There's plenty of reasons to do things that are that look good and feel good. 
And I usually look at that. I usually look at the greater good in that regard as a species rather than as like an individual. And I'm doing my part as best I can. And so, but yeah, you know, if you uh, have any other inkling of why the world is the way it is, if you start to, like, this is like this, the whole government conspiracy, like the government's behind a lot of different things. It's just like, like, remember how I was talking last class about how if you can't recognize your own insecurities, it's actually, it's putting blinders on, right? Yes. And so a lot of these conspiracies, like, I feel like that's what happens. It's like, just, nobody just wants to just believe that they're sick and dying or unhealthy because of their own unhealthy behavior, you know? Yeah. Or they're, they're, they're not as capable of just seeing things as for what they are. So for instance, I mentioned uh, I'm vegan, right? I'm not going to get too deep into this preaching to you guys. But if you really look at what we do to animals, it's clearly monstrous. Yeah. You know, like if you just stepped aside and just looked at it objectively, you're like, yeah, this is like, we're, we're terrible species. We are literally like, imagine if like lions just like rounded up all the like gazelles and all the zebras and all, and they just like made them live in this like close quarters and just made them grind through this, terrible short existence you know yeah of misery and torture just so they can have like a zebra steak every day every hour of the day or anytime they want during the day right yeah well in reality like a lion can go like a week without eating you know and when they kill they only usually kill one or two like a pack because that's all they really need yeah like people, whenever I would debate people about this, they would be like, "Well, you know, lions eat," and I'm like, "Yep," yeah. but in moderation. Even that argument doesn't hold true. Even our ancestors, yeah. it's just not reality. Industrial, been- yeah, industrialized uh, processing of food has has done this. Why was the rainforests on fire in Brazil? Like, why is that a why is like people are like making it seem like it's a new thing right no the amazons are always on fire this is like actually one of the things too that i think a lot of conservative talking talking points were like hey you know this is normal they everyone's flipping out for no reason but is it normal like is it actually normal why do they do it so often and why is it so much do you know why isn't a uh, part of the i can't remember the isn't it like the farming where they burn away the land? Yeah. Like, isn't that, yeah. It's, uh, exactly. But what are they farming? What is it for? What type of farming? Isn't it like uh, soybeans and stuff like that? Like palm tree and uh, like yeah. palm yeah, yeah. oil? And what is that for? It's like for all the stuff we have. <laughs> yes, like, again, absolutely. Like but specifically to feed the animals that we eat. Yeah. Like people say, oh, I remember like people would say like, oh, like soybeans, like vegans, see, they're bad. No, the, there's so much because they feed the cows and the chickens and the pigs. It's actually for them. It's actually for the very animals that we eat. It's kind of crazy, man. If you start going down, you're like, oh my gosh, man. what yeah, are we doing, man? Or the antibiotics. We're, all that stuff. Yeah, we're, we're real terrible, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Like we're really bad. And um, like objectively, our species is just not great. And so, like, people get really happy about, like, this idea of, like, we have, like, spaceships and stuff. It's like, yeah, that's cool, and I love space and science, but that does not make up for all the other terrible stuff that we do. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't. And so, um, you know, this, this is kind of what I'm saying. Like, if you start just thinking things like this a little more animalistically, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it actually is beneficial because you won't be as... Like, if you start looking at us as a species like this, like, you can understand why people have their reactions that they do. Both, like, the police, for instance, and, like, the protesters. Like, it makes sense. You know? It does. It's it's pretty understandable. And you can also sympathize with people a lot easier. Right? Because if you start thinking of people, like, these are natural reactions of, like, a biological impulse, that's different than that person's just evil. Yeah. Right? Like, if you look at somebody who is a... Uh, like a you know domestic abuse person, right? Who beats up on their wife, 
instead of just looking at them as an evil person, you say, well, it's probably a circumstance of their environment and their, uh, their uh, parentage, like whoever t- like raised them or lack of. Yeah. And you can fix that. It takes a lot of work and effort, and we unfortunately don't have any kind of real, you know, scalable system to prevent this type of stuff. Yeah. But you can. You can totally prevent it. You know? And you can fix it, too. You can fix people that are, like, in this way. Uh, right now, the strategy that I think a lot of people are employing, I don't think is a good one, which is the cancel culture. Just go all in, like, unforgivable. Nobody is forgivable. Yeah. Like, it's very short-sighted because people then realize, wait, I make mistakes, too. <laughs> and then, people change. Yeah, and then and then people go after them, and then it's just like, uh oh, it's 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 a never ending system. Uh, no, don't get this twisted. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be accountability. That's different, but like this yeah. lack of like empathy uh, is is a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think of the world in this way. You know, it helps me a lot. Like it helps me navigate a lot of things. And now yeah. let's bring it all the way back to art. Like. So when I started thinking about the word talent, I don't think of talent as a thing anymore. Does it make sense? Because like, I realize it just isn't a thing. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't people that are genetically more dis- like, like disproportionately better at something. That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that it just means that people are uh, better at some things than others. But just like you can get good at, like if you look at animals that are trained and you can train like a gorilla or, or an ape or even dogs to speak using sign language. Mm-hmm. You can do the same to us. It's a survival skill that most animals have, including us. We're just better at it because we have bigger brains, you know, mm-hmm. especially cognitive stuff, cognitive skills. A lot of these types of things can be taught to almost anybody. As long as you have all the right faculties you know? Yeah. So going back to time management, totally can learn how to get really good at it. Can manage your depression, manage your anxiety, manage your self-esteem, manage all of these things. If you just look at yourself as an animal and you need to treat your, train your ape brain, you know? Yeah. And it's really hard because your ape brain does not <laughs> want to do it, you know? Because it's yeah. like, yo, you're dumb. It is just so much better if we just sit around doing nothing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. and your brain is right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it is better. It's low cost energy, right? It yeah. pumps you up with the endorphins. It's just unfortunate because you and I have been born and raised in an environment where we are surrounded by things that just do that. So we actually have no sense of gratitude, no sense of, perspective and all this stuff we have to be reminded you know where if you are living in the wild living like there's this great case study where it shows like you know when you look at countries that are that are just dirt poor like poorer than our poorest here in the states but they live very happy and fulfilling lives and it's like wait a minute what so poverty isn't the perfect like oh if you're poor then that's a that's a recipe for disaster for like crime and then you know, bad health, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. What, it, what it proved was more as like uh, proximity of poverty, meaning that if you know that your neighbor is driving like Ferraris and living a life of luxury and you're over here eating off, out of the dirt, that comparison is the problem. And we live in a culture where we're constantly seeing this stuff. Uh, ArtStation does it to other artists. And I also always have yeah. to remind my students, like, Use ArtStation as a reference in the every sense of that word. Don't use it as a reminder of how bad you are, right? Yeah. In a negative way. Like just say, okay, this is where I need to be and I can get there. It just takes time mm-hmm. versus, oh my God, how am I ever going to get there? Look at all yeah. these great artists. Because all of them also sucked at some point, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. but, you know, you gotta you gotta think of it this way, you know. Like your your ape brain is not built for this environment. We're not built for this. We just aren't. And so we're not really good at dealing with it. But you could train yourself. You can teach yourself to like understand this and respect it, you know? 
Yeah. And you can teach yourself to be grateful. You can find ways to be positive. You can you can teach and train yourself to see the greater perspective of things. And some people are just out of the gate already there. Like for me, I was always a very optimistic individual. And it's helped me in a lot of ways. You know? Yeah. But there have been times where being optimistic was just not, didn't feel good. I mean, like recently, it's been like that, <laughs> you know? Really? <clears throat> yeah, just seeing how like, as a species, right? Just seeing how the world is, it's just like, man, we're really bad at this stuff, man. <laughs> and it's really disheartening. And, but I will say that I still stay positive. Like I, I uh, find ways to just talk to people that I disagree with and try to convince them or let rather convince them to have good conversations to kind of show them that maybe they need to really have a different perspective, that they might be on the wrong side of history. <clears throat> but that's like really hard to scale. Like the rate in which bad news travels is exponentially faster and harder than uh, good news, you know? Yeah. So, but with that said, keep that in mind when you're trying to get good at stuff that you're just a human animal and you can train yourself, you know? Yeah. One thing you could do too that is really good is like reward yourself, like give yourself rewards for doing certain things, like play a video game for 30 minutes or something, but only after you've done the thing that you said you're going to do. Like you're in, like, you're like training a chimpanzee, you know, yeah. but you're just, you're the chimpanzee in this experiment. You know what I mean? Yes. Like I always think, like it would be interesting to see an alien's perspective of us. Yeah. <laughs> like when they come to our planet, like I don't think they would necessarily just come and destroy us. Like um, this idea of aliens coming just to like invade our planet is also very arrogant. Like we don't do that with like animals. You know what I mean? Like um, we don't like, uh, or sorry, not animals, uh, ants. Right, we don't like go over to like an ant hill and just be like, "I'm gonna invade this ant hill." <laughs> I mean, maybe when you're a kid, right? But like, yeah, but not at, not out of like necessity. It's usually out of sport or even indirect. Like you're mowing a lawn and you didn't realize there's a ant colony, you know? Yeah, I feel it would be the same. I think aliens will just like skip right past us and go straight for our sun, and just start taking the sun energy until it just yeah. dries out and then just fly to the next solar system. And we would just be, we would just be helpless watching our son just getting eaten a lot. Oh, definitely. You know? And they'd be like, oh, look at this species. Like, <laughs> they can't and they would look at us like ants. They'd be like, look how they built like the society. You know, look how, like, look how advanced they are for that kind of species. Of, like, look, they're like making like rockets. That's pretty impressive. Like the same way we see like ants making little boats out of themselves. Or, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. How cute. <laughs> you know, a, aliens will look at us the same way. Be like, "Oh, how cute these little they they're they're able to go to the moon." Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Anyways, all right, moving on to Alpha Centauri. <laughs> you know, as our <laughs> sun's just like evaporated. You know, <clears throat> maybe there would be like ants or, or alien researchers that study indigenous species. You know, <laughs> they're yeah. just like, "Oh, look at these. Let's put them in a glass and just take them <laughs> with us." You know. Yeah. There could be some, you know, preservation, but only as in the same perspective that we look at other, uh, at like our own zoos and, and stuff. Yeah, it's like, this is a new thing. Let's study it. But I doubt that. I think what might end up happening is just they just fly through and they would look at us even less than that. They would look at us like microbials, you know, and there's only like a sub group of that alien species that might even care if they even cared. Yeah. But yeah, I always think about that. I'm like, yeah, that's probably what really would happen. <laughs> Movies are always inaccurate. I had this movie pitch where it was pretty much that, where they would, it was just an alien invasion, but it wasn't like anything you've ever seen. It was essentially they just ate the sun, and the whole movie was just about like existential terror, <laughs> right? Yeah. Just like, what can you do? And it would be, <laughs> it's all about like just embracing the life that you had, like when you know you're going to die, right? Yeah, or like that the end is clear, you know, mm -hmm. and it will be more about a, mo a movie about humanity and how it embraces with that versus like 
aliens coming in, blowing up stuff, and it's like looking cool. It would be more of a cerebral film than it would be a, uh, like, and just using aliens as a ca- catalyst. There was a movie that okay. did this. It was called Melancholy, but I don't think they did a good job. It was too artsy fartsy. It was a real good good movie and the one I just pitched there, right? Like there's something there you can really tell a very yeah. human story. Also it counters a issue that I think a lot of people just don't want to acknowledge or cope with. They go you, like everyone's gonna die at some point. It's another, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people just they don't want to acknowledge that fact. They don't want to acknowledge their own mortality. Yeah, I think that that's what that movie would do. This would be the alien right here. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna roll out now, guys. It was great class. Uh, great work, everybody. Good stuff as normal. Uh, have a great weekend. Don't be strangers. And uh, keep up the good work, guys. You guys are doing great. Feeling very, very confident with you guys' progress so far. So talk to you guys soon. Have a great night. Talk to you guys next week. Uh, and happy 4th of July for those of you who celebrate or care. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.